In The Color of Love, memoirist Mara Gad explains what it's like to live in the gorgeous places in between. For Gad, a mixed-race Jewish woman who was born to a young Jewish woman in New York in 1970 and then adopted and raised in Chicago, that place has always been complicated. Our synagogue was almost not almost, it was entirely Ashkenazi, so all Eastern European Jews, and one brown little girl. Um, and people had things to say. Now it's Gad's turn to speak. As one of the featured authors at the 41st annual St. Louis Jewish Book Festival, Gad commanded the stage and shared an uncomfortable but universal truth. Nobody, nobody, nobody wants to think that they're racist. I have had my intolerant moments. It's a human condition. Jews are not above it. Black people are not above it. And it's our human issue to solve. But in order for that to happen, we have to acknowledge that it exists. In The Color of Love, Gad explores that harsh reality through her relationship with her racist great aunt, whose cruelty eventually leads to her estrangement from Gad's family. But years later, when Gad finds out that her aunt is suffering from Alzheimer's and living in San Francisco, she pushes past that pain and fights on her behalf to bring her home to Chicago. I've always been incredibly private about this part of my life. But I would say probably over the last five or six years, there's been this window culturally that has opened up where we are talking about it. We are talking about what it means to be multiracial. And there are kids that need to know that you can be black, brown, Jewish, whatever you are, and the way that you made is beautiful. So it was time. Mara Gad, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. How did it come about? What caused you to write this? Five or six years ago, people in Hollywood, um, and I, I produce film and TV for a living, and so people in Hollywood started coming to me as culturally we started talking more about other, like people that we consider to be unusual in, in terms of the way that they're made up. Um, and they were asking about my life rights, but they were telling me what they thought my story was. And so somebody called me a tragic mulatto girl. Yes, a tragic mulatto girl who would then search for her biological. And I was like, stop. A, don't call me tragic. B, who uses the word mulatto in the 21st century? And I'm not searching for my biologicals. And so it struck me that I did have a story and, if, and that it was mine to tell, like that I needed to tell it myself for a thousand reasons. And it sort of snowballed from there. You called your memoir The Color of Love. Yes. Was that always the title? It wasn't. Um, the original title, when we went back and did the proposal a couple of years ago, was called the Yerusha. Um, Yerusha is the Yiddish word for inheritance. And we had built the, the pitch around talking about what I had inherited from my relationship with my great aunt that gets chronicled in the second half of the book. But when we finished, it didn't work. It wasn't accessible to people. Nobody knew what it meant. Um, and this felt more central to the story. It's central to who I am. Um, and hopefully something that people will connect to, even when they just look at it on a shelf and think, oh, I'll buy that one. Um, so we went with that. You mentioned that for your parents, uh, it was never fight or flight. It was always fight. Yes. And there was, unfortunately, a fight. Constantly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, Back in 1970, adoption was often very secret. People would look for kids that would look like them. And here my parents brought a biracial baby into a very white neighborhood. Um, and there are misconceptions about what Jews look like. There are misconceptions about black people being Jewish. And so it set off a firestorm in the neighborhood, in our family, at our synagogue. Everybody had some strangers on the street would stop my mother if she was pushing me out in the stroller. And they would look at, look at me and say, well, is she yours? And my mother would get snippy and say, no, she's the milkman's kid. You know, it, people just felt free to comment because I was different. 
Um, and it was, it was very challenging. I don't think anybody really understood what was going to happen. And beyond even, as you said, the normal racial factor, you were in a very close-knit, homogenous community, yeah. too. Yeah, and Chicago's a very segregated city. You know, it still is in a lot of ways. Um, and especially so, so, right, in 1970. Yeah, and so very close-knit community. Um, our synagogue was almost, not almost, it was entirely Ashkenazi, so all Eastern European Jews, and one brown little girl. Um, and people had things to say. There was a rumor at my synagogue when I was young that my mother had been raped by a black man, but they decided to keep the baby anyway, and that's why I look this way. And people would feel like they could say that with an earshot of me. And I had to go home at like seven years old and ask what rape was, because that was the origin story that, that, cre that, that they created, that that would be the only reason why I could look this way. Like they were doing you a favor by giving you some well, sort of... Well, they had of, to make up a story, right? right? The, an excuse or there something. There had right? to be a story. It isn't to say that everybody was terrible. I don't like to make sweeping generalizations about anyone or groups of people. Um, our rabbi, um, Herman Shalman, of much beloved memory, he used to say, you know what, she's mine. And if you have a problem, you can come to me. Um, but it was, it was very hard, you know? Do you remember the moment when you first became aware? Was it, was it that type of incident, or was it even younger when you became aware of the, of, of the otherness, as you have, have termed it? I, I remember the day that somebody told me that I didn't look like my family. Like my parents, I grew up understanding that I'd been adopted, and we had storybooks and all kinds of things to help frame that. But I did not have any understanding that I didn't look like my family. Um, and there was a, a girl that I was friends with, and we were playing one day, and I was, I was around that same age, six or seven, and she said, you know, my parents said that your real mother didn't love you, and so she gave you away, and that's why you live with this family, and you don't look like your parents. And it was like my whole world exploded, because the story that I knew about adoption is that adoption is an act of love, and here she made it sound like somebody didn't want me, and, and like left me to be taken by, you know. But when she said, you don't look like your family, I thought, well, what do you mean I don't look like my family? And I ran home in tears, and my mother had to explain that no, I don't look exactly like them. And she had to try, I, I can't remember what she said. I know I felt okay when it was all over, but I do remember the first time somebody said to my face, and it was a child who said it, it was a child, because her parents had taught her that, you know? Um, and I'm always struck by that moment, because there were adults saying all kinds of things. But for a child to, to bring me that was, uh, I think that there's, there's a lot to look at in that. You've talked, too, about how your mom was so strong, both your parents and your grandmother, so strong through the evolution of this as you grew up. Yes. Have you ever talked about how hard it was, that feeling as a parent of thinking, oh, when's the next oh, my mother still. attack going to come? That had to have been an awful feeling for your child. We, my, my father passed away when I was 19. Um, and my father and I never had that conversation because really... I saw it in him every day. He really, tru and I probably will get weepy, I apologize. Um, Just the thought of it. Of he really, truly wanted to protect me in every way that he could. And I watched him do it so we didn't have to talk about it. Um, my mom and I still talk about it. I, I recently had an incident where um, something happened when I was on the road, and my mother at 75 years old was like, do you need me to come? Do you want me to come? I will come. My mother will always, always, until she draws her last breath, be my greatest defender. Gosh, your warrior, wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure the internalization of that wears on you. I mean, I, I grew up with this sense of people are always talking about us. It's always because of me. Um, and I can't say it was guilt. That wasn't the feeling. And God knows my parents went out of their way to make sure that I knew I was beautiful and amazing and their daughter, and that was all that mattered. And my mom will still say she never wished that I was different. She often has wished the world was different, but never me. 
and she never, there was never a regret for her, and she never, there's nothing that she needed to be different. This, this is simply our family's path. Your family and you, you carried the story together privately for so many years. Yes. What caused you to finally decide to share it with the world? I do think that culturally we are finally talking about things in a way that we have not in many, many, many decades, if ever. Um, and I also, I think that I was silent for so many years because I did want to fit in. And I, I wanted people to like me and accept me. And nobody wanted to talk about it. You could see this palpable discomfort. And so I figured if I don't talk about it, maybe, maybe like my Bubby would say, they won't know <laughs> that I'm different from everyone That's else. That's right. You mentioned that, that your, yeah. that your Bubby just ha had a unique way or <laughs> my <laughs> Bubby, my method Bubby. for dealing with it. Yeah, she was funny. She used to say, oh, why do you tell people you're adopted? If you don't tell people, they won't know. And I was like, Bubby. It's just that simple. They know. <laughs> I was like, look at us. They know. But I think on some level, I was quiet, too, because... I didn't, nobody wanted to talk about it and I knew that and I didn't want people to be more uncomfortable. You know, sometimes I didn't talk about it because it was a safety issue. If a racist is coming for you and yeah. there, you feel that notion of being unsafe, of being physically unsafe, you close your mouth, you pray that you get through it and you keep it moving and that has served me well on more than one occasion. I've had people put their hands on me and out of fear and self-preservation, I've kept my mouth shut. But I, I can't anymore. I can't, I don't want to be quiet anymore. It is not right that at 50 years old, I still rarely can walk into a synagogue or a Jewish building without somebody wondering if I'm someone's nanny or caregiver or the kitchen help or there to help with the band, which was a question I got on Rosh Hashanah morning this year in LA. It is not right that I am still told routinely that I wasn't made the right way. I, I, was, um, I was talking with a, a black man who came to one of my book events and he looked at me and he said, you're that black Jewish girl, aren't you? And I said, I am. And he said, I hope someday you do find Jesus. Because there is this misconception that black people are Christian or Muslim, but not Jewish. I'm tired. I'm tired of being quiet. And I'm tired of people telling me that the way I was made isn't right. There's nothing wrong with the way that I was made. And that sense that you've experienced that you weren't, you were never enough of anything. Yes, or that I should not choose. Not black enough, not Jewish Not black enough, enough not, not, I'm certainly not white enough, right? Like, I'm not white. Um, but th there's also this pressure that you should choose to be something. That you can't be both. That I can't be everything. That I can't just be everything and have that be beautiful. Um, I am... I am human. I'm fully, beautifully human. And if that isn't enough for people, then they are not my people, you know? How did it come about that you finally decided to take the leap and say, I am going to put this story out there? Had it been brewing in you for a while or was no. something that sort of like... <laughs> That's the funny thing. Because no. you work in storytelling. You're, you're, right, you're a producer and you... I, right. So and you're visualizing other people's stories all the time. Yes, but. I bring other people's stories to life. And never, I never thought about writing a book. But like I said, people were asking me for my life rights. And so my friends in the industry very quietly were like, Mara why don't you just write a book? And then there will be source material. I mean, it was all kind of slightly business driven at first. There'll be source material. And then nobody can tell you what your story is or is not. Take ownership of yeah. it. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I'll write a book. And it, was, and, and it was like everything opened up. I made what I now am coming to understand some people think is a brave choice. But it just, it was the right time. It was the right time. And I do think that in a world that is growing increasingly more diverse and beautifully more diverse, I never saw anyone who looked like me as a kid, who looked like me, who sounded like me. If I can be that for someone else, what a gift that is. 
what an incredible gift that is to be able to, to say to young people, you know, the way you are made is beautiful and perfect just as you are. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, I feel uniquely qualified to say that. One of the other central parts of the story, or rather sort of the tent pole that, that this is sort of built around, too, is your experience with, with your aunt, that you wanted nothing more than for her to love you. Yes. And she withheld that. Oh, yes. And that, so, so this is a lifetime story, right, that just kind of came to. You know, when you're, when you're a kid, right, you have some relatives that you're really drawn to, and others maybe not so much. And I was so drawn to her. Um, and all I wanted was for this like well-traveled, seemingly glamorous aunt that, that sort of came into our lives when I was about 10. And she was your mom's? My mom's aunt. Favorite so, aunt too, yes. right at the time. They had a real special. Yes, she had been, um, she was my mother's brother's sister. Um, my mother's father was an abusive, abusive man to everyone, to his sister, to his wife, to my mother. And so, my mother, you know, when she was in college, went and lived with Nettie to get away from the house. Um, Nettie was my mother's favorite aunt and in many ways, you know, sort of like a, a third parent to her. When I met her, I remember thinking, oh my God, this woman is sparkly and amazing and I totally want to connect to this woman. And even at that first visit, she made it clear that my sister could sort of touch her jewelry and her things but when I wanted to, she said she was tired and it was time for everybody to let her take a nap. And only in retrospect do you see those tiny moments add up to what became an explosive moment at my sister's wedding. Um, she was, racism is an abuse, right? Is, it is an abuse of the soul. And clever abusers don't leave bruises where people will see them because they don't want to be seen as, as an abuser. Nettie was a very clever racist. She never hit when my parents were around. She always struck when we were alone. And so... She was conscious of her image. Sure. She didn't want to seem less in the eyes of my mother or certainly my Bubby. They were best friends from childhood. And so it was only when we were alone and it was those little digging, horrible comments. You know, I was never allowed to touch her. I couldn't play with her jewelry like my sister could. Just stay away from me. I'm tired. You know, now's not a good time. Um, and it sounds like the kind of thing where you kept thinking, is it me? I, I did wonder if it was me. But that because sort of sinister way of making it feel like you're Like I had done something. Yeah. But other relatives were very clear. They did not like having a Schwarze in the family. Schwarze is the Yiddish word for, well, basically, it's the equivalent of saying nigger. They were clear. So it was a very easy. Out there. It was a very easy out there. You're not welcome in our house anymore. Nettie didn't do that. And so I don't I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what to say. I didn't you know, it, it was a very strange dynamic. Um, but it all came to a head at my sister's wedding. She'd had a bit too much to drink. And she, you know, she looked me up and down right before my sister was going to walk down the aisle. And she said, you know, you're very lucky we ever let you in the family. I mean, me having a Chinese husband is one thing, but nothing is worse than black. And she said it in front of everyone. On this beautiful day that should have been. On this beautiful day, she just, there it was. And it was like a bomb went off. You know, everybody, stood, thank God my sister and brother-in-law were not in the room. They were getting, you know, mentally prepared to walk down the aisle. But there it was. And once that happened, that was it. She, like everybody else, had to go the other way. But she was the one that I wanted to connect to. And I, I tried to because it was never as clear as it was on that day what her problem was. The bullet that came at you and you had to stand there and, I mean, what does that do to you? I can't say it was the first time. Yeah. It was arguably one of the worst times just because when something like that happens, what I always wanted to do was to shrink inside of myself or leave. That wasn't an option. That was not an option that day. I was supposed to sing. My sister was walking down the aisle. There was a family celebration, and leaving was not an option. And, and so I had to take like five minutes, gather myself, swallow it down, get through the day, and then you have to let the pain out later. You know? Does it kind of... 
oh, does it just take a piece out of you each time? Do you get to the point where? I don't let it anymore. How do you? I don't, therapy. I've, I've been in therapy for, no, I'm serious. I've no, been I in, believe it. Yeah. I've been in therapy for. I don't know how you, someone, right, could, you could survive that. It's abuse. So. It is abuse. Yeah. And, and I, I have been in therapy for 25 years. Um, I believe that it is the reason why I am still alive. Um, because otherwise, it does, it is a poison that people feed you. And eventually, you keep ingesting. You know, my silence was, was me it continuing to ingest poison, right? And so, um, yeah, I think if you don't find a way to acknowledge the pain, to acknowledge um, the anger, you know, like think about how many people live in this constant state of anger. That too eats you alive. And so I, I made a choice that I didn't want to live that way. I can't live that way. I don't believe we're supposed to live in a state of anger and pain constantly. I believe love is why we are here. We are here to love and to be loved. And if that isn't the constant experience you're having, I needed some help to figure out how to manage it. And some days I still do. But I do not let people take anything from me anymore. For you to tell this story, was that part of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was my way of no longer being afraid of making people uncomfortable with the things that I have to say or with the reality of my life. So many people meet me and think nothing bad has ever happened to me. When I was still working in musical theater, I auditioned way back in the day for the touring company of Rent. And I got called back and called back and called back and called back. And the director finally pulled me aside. He said, here's the problem I have. He said, look at you you don't look like you know what it is to have suffered for one minute, much less lived on the street. He said, I don't know what to do with that. And I said, it's called acting. You have no idea what I've been through. And he said, but you don't carry it. I look at you and all I see is light and joy and love. And I thought, wow, I must be a much better actress than I thought I was because I was carrying all of that with me, you know? So, um, yes, this book is my way of saying, no, this is the truth. This is what it feels like when you look at someone who you think doesn't belong where you are or say something to a stranger that is wildly inappropriate. This is what that does to people. That comes across so strongly in the memoir, too, this this feeling that you see all of this now as as almost a special gift that you've been yes, given I do defining your role it I think that each of us has our things right that we can view as the things that make our life harder or the things that give us something unique that we get to carry out into the world and it takes a lot of work to be able to find that that balance and to claim your life as a gift um, but I really do view myself as being tremendously blessed. I cannot think of anyone who has been loved in the way that I have, really. And that, and yes, I also know what hate looks like, which is why I know what I want to put out in the world. Something that's so clear t throughout your memoir is just your deep love for your faith and your heritage yes. and Judaism. Uh, that has always been a constant for you. You've never questioned no, that part I would, of your identity ever. I would choose, if, if I were to choose a religion, I would choose to be Jewish. I think being Jewish is really beautiful and, and what Judaism teaches us is beautiful. What do you love about it that, that resonates with you and has throughout your life? Judaism is rooted in love. It is rooted in love of family. It is rooted in love of community. The notion of tikkun olam, that we are here to, to help make the world a more beautiful place, to repair a broken world. I think all of those things are so beautiful um, and, and that we celebrate and mourn as a community. It, Judaism is about community. Kehila Kadosha, like beloved, blessed community. Like it's, there's beauty in that. The book has been embraced by so many yes. uh, in the Jewish community. What's that been like after a lifetime of, of, of having to say, yes, I am Jewish to, what's that like? I am still, sort of pinching myself and amazed and humbled and grateful um, 
that I am being, that my, that my book is being embraced in the way that it is. Um, it was funny, you know, normally if I'm, if <laughs> I'm so embarrassed to even say this. Normally, if I'm in a room full of Jews and it's my first time there, I'm always, I'm, I'm slightly on high alert wondering what's happening. So last night when um, the chairs of the book festival so graciously asked me to stand up, you know, they, they introduced a couple of, of authors that were in the audience. I heard a woman near me say, oh, I thought I recognized her. And it was the first time in my whole life that it was because somebody recognized me because of my book and not because they wanted to know who the brown girl was. And I had this moment of, oh. And she came up to me afterwards and she said, I knew that was you. I read your book and I saw your picture and I'm coming to your presentation and I'm so happy to meet you. And I just thought, wow, like that's, that's amazing, you know? That's amazing for me. You mentioned too, this is personal for you beyond your own experience. You have a niece who is. Yes, I do. My, my niece is also biracial. Um, and I pray that the world is different for her than it was for me. And I see that at least on its face, it looks different, right? Our community is so much more diverse. And, and there, she is not the only one. I was the only one. She's not the only one. But I want her to know that she has a voice right now. And I never want her to be silent or feel like she needs to be silent. I want her to know that there are people that came before her, that she's not the only one. In your foreword, you have a beautiful line about coming to embrace the fact that you inhabit the beautiful space in between. Yes. Uh, that just hit me. <laughs> Thank you. It was beautiful because I could, uh, sense from that, that that's not something, that's something you came to understand and appreciate yes. and love. And it's so clear how happy you are with your life. It took me a long time to be here, fully inhabiting my life, claiming my joy, claiming my beauty, claiming my voice, claiming my space wherever I want to be. Um, and I'm, I'm happy. I really am. I say it in the book and I mean it. I am the luckiest girl. And and I I count my blessings every day. Mara Gat, thank you so much for joining us. It's thank been a you. Pleasure. Thank you.